Praise the Lord. Amen. <coughs> wow, I'm filled with joy to hear that about the Gosnell family. And Travis giving that great report. Children are a tremendous blessing from the Lord. And what a fitting psalm to be read concerning that. That children are something that are not to be considered as our culture would like us to think as a burden or as a curse or as a, even something that creates much difficulty for the family. Rather, it, they are a heritage from the Lord and a great blessing to family. So I'm excited to, to hear of a new image bearer coming soon. And um, let us be in prayer for that precious soul. And uh, let us be in prayer for the family uh, as they anticipate the coming of this new child. Well, with that said, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1 is where we're at. Philippians chapter 1. As we've been walking through uh, this chapter, it's been such an encouragement to me. And um, Even though we, we've only seen very little uh, of the book, relatively speaking, to the rest of it. So um, I anticipate that uh, the next few weeks and months will... We'll uh, get through all of it and uh, move on to the next book. We're going to be in uh, we're going to be in verse fifteen this morning, verse fifteen of Philippians chapter one. The Apostle Paul's writing here, as we know, he's writing under the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he writes this, and I'll actually go back and uh, I'll start in. Um, in verse 12, just to give a little bit of context so that we, so that we remember what uh, we looked at last week and we remember exactly what he's talking about in the, in the greater context. In verse 12, he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. And then this is verse 15. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I will rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. <coughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking that He would bless the preaching of His Word. <laughs> o Father in heaven, Father of glory, the one who spoke and the, the, the heavens were created, the earth and all the inhabitants therein, the one who, Scripture says, upholds that creation that he made and that he will uphold it until the, until the inevitable return of Christ. We plead for you to pour out blessings upon us this morning, as we look at your word, we pray that there would be zeal that would consume us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be like him, of whom it is said, zeal for your house will consume me. I pray that our passion for the things of God would increase. Our love for our blessed Lord would grow all the more stronger. And as Father, we look at uh, this text of Scripture when we consider the, the nature of hypocrisy, the nature of a false, uh, a false preacher, a false preacher of the Gospel. I pray that You would use it to awaken hypocrites, that You would use it to awaken those who say they believe one thing but act as though they do not, who are practical atheists, who live as though Christ never gave a law to obey and who do not delight in that law. We pray for their conversion to Christ, true conversion to Christ, not a pseudo-conversion, not a merely outward conversion, but an inward changing of the heart. We know that you promised through the prophet Ezekiel that that is the essence of this new covenant, that you will take out the heart of stone 
And you will give sinners parts of flesh. And we who are in Christ can give testimony to that wondrous act that you have changed us and made us more like Him. That you have, you have given us a hungering and a thirsting after righteousness. And so we rejoice. And we pray chiefly that our Lord is, is glorified in the preaching of His Word. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. I think all of us can confess that we uh, are aware of the reality of hypocrites being in our midst. That uh, we have had interactions even, unfortunately, with hypocrites from time to time. Uh, even those of us who are in Christ, I think, can give testimony that there have been times in our lives when we have behaved as hypocrites, when we have borne the fruit of hypocrisy. And Scripture, time and time again, especially in the New Testament, warns us of the reality of hypocrisy and of the presence of hypocrites in the church. In fact, it was our Lord who warned concerning false Christs, false messiahs who would come. It was the apostles who, Paul especially, had encounters with false apostles and who warned about false apostles. Scripture tells us about false teachers and preachers and pastors. And we're also warned about just the lay person, even the Christian who may not be involved in full-time ministry. We're warned even about those who profess to know Christ, yet do not. We're warned about even the, the makeup of our congregations being partially of hypocrites. And Paul here in Philippians chapter 1 outlines and shows us some of the aspects of hypocrisy and in so doing, he is talking here about these false preachers who actually preached the gospel, but did so with ill motives, with, with, with wicked motives, which uh, gave evidence to the fact that they themselves were hypocrites. And so we're going to see four things as we walk through this passage. Four things. One, we're going to see the fact of hypocrisy. And secondly, we're going to see the, uh, the opposite of of hypocrisy, because Paul shows us the opposite of, of what a hypocrite is. Thirdly, we're going to see the heart of hypocrisy. What is it in its essence? Where does it come from? What is it in its origin? And lastly, we're going to see Paul's response to the hypocrites of his day that were distressing him at this present moment. So let us first consider the fact of hypocrisy. The fact of hypocrisy, beginning in verse 15. Paul the Apostle writes... When he says some here, when he says some, he's referencing this group of people that he brought to our attention in verse 14 when he said, and that most of the brethren, these are people who identify themselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus' followers. He says some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. Just as a side note, the the word here that the, that the, uh, the apostle uses, uh, preaching, in the Greek is caruso. That they're heralding, the, the word caruso means to herald, means to noise abroad, means to, to loudly proclaim. These people aren't, uh, we could say, privately teaching. These are actually people who have open ministries, and they're preaching Christ. So to preach Christ is to preach the gospel in its essence. In fact, we, we, you've heard me use that phrase, to preach Christ. That is the gospel. Jesus is the gospel. He himself is the good news. And if you are preaching Christ, you are preaching that gospel that Paul and the apostles and the Lord Jesus himself preached. You know, Jesus preached himself. Jesus preached of himself, concerning himself. You see this in, uh, in Luke, 20, Luke 24, I think it is, on the road to Emmaus. He's with the two disciples and he tells them of himself from the Old Testament scriptures. He's bringing to them the gospel message. An example of this is in Acts 8.5, speaking of Philip and his missionary endeavors. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. That is, to tell sinners that Jesus Christ has come into the world and has died a, a death of a criminal and has been exalted and raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That, that's, the, that's the essence of the gospel message. Per 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul says that very thing. And this is what these hypocrites are doing. There's even a sense in which we could say they didn't doubt the gospel that they were preaching. 
There's even a sense in which they had a, a faith. It wasn't a saving faith. It wasn't a legitimate faith. It wasn't a justifying faith. But they had to have believed to some extent what they were saying. Otherwise, they wouldn't be proclaiming. They wouldn't be caruso. They wouldn't be proclaiming. They wouldn't be heralding this noise abroad, this, this, this glorious gospel as they were. And these aren't weak Christians. You know, that's a whole other subject. These aren't weak Christians. And there are weak Christians. And we, as I mentioned, have all experienced seasons, I'm sure. Those of us who have walked with Christ for some season or for some period of time can say we've had seasons of weakness. This is not who Paul is talking about. These are people who are false converts, who are they themselves outside of the saving grace of God as it is revealed in Christ. They're not believers. Uh, John Gill, a famous Bible commentator, said, that is, some of them were only so in profession. He's speaking of their, of their Christianity. Their Christianity was only a Christianity contained in their profession, what they said with their mouths. And it went no further than that. And it is my fear that there are many in this room, or few, who are in that very same position of hypocrisy, And we are warned in Scripture concerning these people. We are warned in, in, in the Word of God concerning hypocrites and concerning the damage that they do to the church. In fact, turn with me to Matthew 7. We've actually looked at Matthew 7 a couple of times before. And you'll find me going back there often because I think it's so significant. And just to refresh your memory, this was the first verse I ever preached on. The first sermon I ever preached was on Matthew 7. So I think I have a little bit of a bias toward it. But it's nonetheless true. And it's very important what our Lord says here in verse 15. Matthew 7, 15. He says, speaking to His disciples, He says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. There's an analogy already given to us. They're going to, they're going to appear one way. They're going, to be, they're going to present themselves in one way. But inside, where man's eyes cannot pry, where you and I cannot see, they are unchanged. They're lost still. He says in verse 16, You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. So there's a warning, and there, there's, a, there's an indictment even here in this text concerning the hypocrites that sit in churches week after week. That though they profess to know Jesus Christ, Though they, though they have the outward extremities of religion, inwardly, there is no reality of life eternal. Uh, true salvation is the life of God in the soul of man. It is God giving us life. And there is an organic aspect to being saved. In fact, we, 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 are not, uh, we are not like many of our other religious friends, especially like our Catholic friends who really believe in outward change and believe that that's what amends someone to God. That you must perform religious duty to bring yourself into a right position so that God will accept you. Such a view we know to be illegitimate. And we know again that only addresses what? The outward man, but leaves him unchanged. It cleans the outside of the cup, but leaves the inside filthy. That's a scary place to be in. It's a scary place to be in. In fact, it's, I would say it's better to just have the whole cup dirty than to, make your, than to make it appear that it's not. For someone to profess Christ but not to truly be His is a worse place to be in than if they had never heard His name. We're warned elsewhere in 1 John 2, verses 18-19, through 19, John writes, he says, children, we actually looked at John uh, just, uh, what was that, last week? Well, John chapter 2, we actually looked at two weeks ago. 
He says, children, it is the last hour. And just as you had heard that Antichrist is coming, he's speaking of the Antichrist, even now, many Antichrists have appeared. So there could be little Antichrists, those who, who, again, profess Christ, but they're actually against Christ. And the reason we know that they profess Christ is what? They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. So there was a time in which they identified themselves with the church. And they're involved in this church that, uh, that John is writing to, or churches that John is writing to. They're involved there. But what, what's the evidence of their hypocrisy? Was that the fact that they, immediate, they, they eventually departed from the fellowship? And Scripture, building on top of this idea, goes further to challenge us and to call us, and uh, I can even say to command us to guard our own selves from hypocrisy. In 2 Corinthians 13.5, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, tells them, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed fail the test. So we're even called by God to scrutinize, to have a measure, a healthy measure, not, not overboard, but also not too little. A healthy measure of self-scrutiny, of self-examination to guard our own hearts from this terrible state. This terrible state. Hypocrisy. Secondly, let us look at and consider the opposite of hypocrisy. The opposite of hypocrisy. Continuing in verse 15, he says, But some also from good will. In verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So what's, what, what separates uh, the, the true preacher of the gospel or the true Christian from the false one? It is that they follow God, they proclaim the gospel out of a good will. In fact, the, the Greek word for good will is, 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 is one word for, for two words in English, and it's eudokia. Eudokia is one, of my, it's one of my favorite Greek words. And it means good pleasure, delight. It, it's, it's something that the true Christian wants to do because God has given them that desire. That's one of the evidences of conversion. That you follow after God. That you discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Not out of a spirit of slavery or a spirit of fear of condemnation from God. But rather out of goodwill. Out of goodwill. Out of delight. And gladness. And gratitude toward God. In fact, I, the, the word eudokia is used in, uh, in Ephesians 1. And it's actually used concerning the Father. In Ephesians 1.5, it says about the Father, it says, He predestined us, speaking of believers, to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the eudokia of His will. That the kind intention of His will, the good pleasure of His will, His delight was to save us in Christ. To predestine us to that wondrous salvation that we who are in Him have. Also, the word Eutychia is used in uh, Matthew chapter 3 at the baptism of Jesus. When the Father speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's Eudokia. Even the Father was pleased in Christ's, uh, Christ's righteousness. His perfect righteous performance on behalf of His people. So the true Christian, this is, this, is the, this, this is the position, the inward position of the true Christian, that to follow Christ is not a burden. Scripture says, uh, puts it this way, his, his commandments are not burdensome. We saw that in 1 John. He says in verse 16, as I just read, the latter do it out of love. There's a love that's been shed abroad in their hearts. As Paul says in Romans 8, they have the love of God in them. And now they love God and they love their fellow man. And this love, of course, I pointed out this before, is the, the, the Greek word agape. It's this, this selfless love. It's this love that is, that is not concerned with its own well-being. 
It's this love that's not concerned with uh, its own goodwill and its own prosperity. It's a love that forgets self. We see that in Jesus Christ, do we not? In His coming into the world and laying Himself down as the Lamb of God, graciously and selflessly. So this love that, um, that the true Christian acts out of is a, is this a love that is not concerned with self. And it's interesting, and we're going to see this later on, but if you flip that around, so what's the opposite of selflessness? Selfishness. We're going to see in a moment that that is the heart of hypocrisy. That's the heart of hypocrisy and the very heart and the very the nature of sin itself. That it is self-worship, self-idolization. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. He says, knowing, verse 16, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Greek word there is kimai. That he is laid up. In fact, the word kimai is usually translated laid. Laid down or laid up. Paul's been laid up, as it were. He's been, or another way you can translate uh, kimai is, is, is established. Paul's been established, set aside by God for what? For the defense. The Greek word there is apologia. Of the gospel. Of the good news of Christ. And we'll see in a moment as well that the, one of the things that in the immediate context of this verse Paul was experiencing was really a tyranny, you could say, from these false, these false preachers. That they were doing it to, uh, to annoy Paul, to, to be a, a burden to Paul. And it's kind of weird if you think of it like that. Um, why would their preaching of the gospel be an annoyance? Well, actually, Paul, we know in the end, says, no, I'm rejoicing because they're preaching the gospel. They're getting the message of, of Christ out. Uh, and so God is even using uh, them for his own purposes. But for the, the genuine preacher of the gospel, Paul rejoices in them because they stand alongside him. We've seen this already in Philippians 1 with the Philippians standing alongside Paul, partaking of the grace of persecution with him, supporting him in his ministry, and not abandoning him as many did throughout Paul's life. Really, the opposite of, of hypocrisy would be what? We, we could put it another way, it would be consistency. That what you preach and what you uh, profess to know, you act in accordance with, no matter where you're at, no matter who you're around, no matter what situation you are put in, no matter what season of life you find yourself in. That, we could say, is the, the opposite of hypocrisy, because hypocrisy is merely... Uh, to put it another way, is inconsistency. Because you're saying one thing and you are doing another. So let's consider the heart of hypocrisy. That third one in verse 17. The heart of hypocrisy. Verse 17. Paul says, The former proclaim Christ. There it is again. That... that uh, Synonymous use of Jesus in the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So they're concerned with who? Not Paul. Not even the people that they are preaching to. Certainly not God. They're concerned with themselves. And this makes me think about my own, my own life before being a Christian, before being born again at the age of 15. Even before then, I actually had an interest in evangelism, believe it or not. In fact, I would hand out gospel tracts. And, uh, and I love to watch uh, on YouTube these, these witnessing videos. But for me... Again, the intention was very misplaced. I enjoyed evangelism because it stroked my ego and my pride. It, uh, it induced, as it were, thoughts in my mind that I knew I was right. And the people I dealt with were wrong. And guess what? I was actually right. I was right. The gospel is true. Regardless if I'm a hypocrite. 
The Lord Jesus Christ reigns as King regardless if, if I uh, walk in accordance with that or not. And so I, I can say God certainly has probably still used my efforts even as an unbeliever. But it was all done as a hypocrite until I was truly saved. And now I can say it's out of genuine concern for souls. In fact, it's not the most comfortable thing to stand on the street corner and preach the gospel. And not the most enjoyable. But uh, in the same breath, it is the most enjoyable because it's for the Lord Jesus Christ's glory. For His fame and for the souls of men. We are here to win souls. As it says in Proverbs, he who is wise wins souls. So they're, they're, they're selfish. They're not doing it with pure motives. And he even says here at the end of verse 17 that they are thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. This caused me a little bit of confusion when I read this verse because I'm thinking, how would that distress Paul? And uh, when in doubt, I say, always consult your commentaries and consult good ones. And you'll usually find what you're looking for. In such case, I, I went to again, Mr., Mr. John Gill. And this is what he had to say about this. He said, imagining that by their free and bold way of preaching Christ openly in the city, without control and with impunity, it might be thought that the same apostle did not lie in bonds for preaching Christ, but for some other crime. What he's saying here is, these people are preaching Christ and they're not getting persecuted like Paul was. So it could be that they're trying to show the world that Paul's really a criminal for some other wicked deed. He says, or otherwise, why were they not laid hold on and put under confinement also? Or thinking that by such members of them frequently preaching Christ about the city, it would either incense or, and stir up the Jews, Paul's accusers, to persecute him more vigorously, or excite Nero, who was an uh, emperor of Rome, to take more cognizance of his case, and either more closely confine him or hasten the bringing of his case to a hearing, and him to punishment, as the ringleader of the sect, sect to the terror of others. What Gill's really saying here is that what they were trying to do is, is order the political situation in Paul's day and the, the judicial situation that he found himself in to his detriment so that he would be further persecuted. He'd be further hurt. And he even mentions here about Nero so that even the emperor in Rome himself might take notice of Paul and then want to bring him to more punishment, to justice. We can put that in quotations. Because it's certainly not justice to be persecuted for the sake of the gospel. So that's why when we read Scripture, we oftentimes have to keep in mind the cultural context. What's going on in that day? And what, 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 what are the writers and the readers experiencing? And this is something that uh, is hard for us to wrap our minds around, yet Paul, it was very real for him and in a very difficult situation to find himself in. Isn't that odd that someone would be preaching the gospel and proclaiming all the same things that Paul proclaimed, Christ in Him crucified, yet to the end, that they would upset Him further. <coughs> that's dark. <laughs> that, that's wicked. Yet that's the nature of the hypocrite. That's the nature of the unbeliever. That they would use something so holy and something so precious to accomplish such an evil end. But going back to that, what I mentioned earlier about selfishness, as he says there in verse 17, out of selfish ambition, that is the very nature of hypocrisy. And Paul warns against this later on in Philippians 2. He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. That would be the opposite of selfishness. That we regard others as more exalted more, more of a greater character than ourselves. In fact, it's not only the nature of hypocrisy and the very essence of hypocrisy to be selfish. If we go further and we dig deeper, it is the very essence of sin. As we think about in Genesis chapter 3, when we find the fall of man being chronicled, what do we see there? That Satan, the, the serpent's temptation toward the woman and uh, by extension for Adam, was one that was based on, uh, we could say, selfish concerns. What I mean by that is that Satan appealed to their selfishness. 
and called them to be selfish through his temptation. To not be concerned with the glory of God. To not be concerned with the weightiness of the command that they had been given. To not be concerned with the preciousness of communion with God and how that ought to be guarded. But rather to bring themselves a little bit of uh, pleasure to their taste buds. They ate the fruit which was forbidden. It's out of selfishness. And we find that when that happened, what happened? All creation was fractured. All creation was corrupted and tainted. And all the way to this very day, if we scrutinize it, if we look at every sin that we commit and every ill intent that we have, and we dig down to the lowest, uh, the lowest intention, down to the, the, the very uh, foundation of it, it is built on this self-worship, self-idolatry, self-concern. And that's why Scripture constantly points us away from man and away even from the good of man to focus on the glory of God. Because that's ultimately what our concern ought to be. The fame and the honor and the, the worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our motives matter. I think we can glean that from what we've seen thus far. That even as Christians in ministry, our motives are definitely uh, something we are to concern ourselves with. That we are always recalibrating them. Because being that we have that sinful nature, we're always going to be bent toward that selfishness. So lastly, let us consider Paul's response to the hypocrites. Paul's response in verse 18. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ, aka the gospel message, is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Paul recognized this about the providence of God. That in God's sovereign dealings with His creation, He uses hypocrites. He uses hypocrites. Even as a mouthpiece for Himself at times, as we see here. We can let our imaginations roam a little bit and think, perhaps there were even souls... Converted under the preaching of these hypocrites. That doesn't take away from the fact that they are hypocrites and in great sin, but it shows us that God can, that God will, and God does use those very people to accomplish His purposes. I think an example out of the Old Testament of this is King Saul. I think he was a, a tremendous failure, tremendous failure in terms of a king. Character-wise, even in his actions, in his leadership, it was disastrous. Yet what? God used him. God used him. God used him to accomplish what he had foreordained to come to pass. And all throughout history, God's done that. In fact, we ought to remember this. Just because God uses something somebody does, does not mean that they're born again. Their Christ. It doesn't. It doesn't. So, brethren, concerning hypocrisy, it is my exhortation that you guard yourselves from it with the greatest, the greatest diligence. You know, at the end of the book of 1 John, what's the last phrase that's, tell, that's given? Those of you who remember. Last Sunday, last Lord's Day evening, that last phrase at the end of the book of, 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 of the end of the book of First John says, "Little children, guard yourselves from idols." And as I mentioned, what is what is the what is the very essence of sin and hypocrisy? It's selfishness. It's self idolization. It's self worship. We need to protect from that. That's the greatest of all idols, and from it, every other idol that sins, and they'll weigh our souls down. And utterly destroy our communion with God, brethren, in this world. And for you, perhaps who are in here, who profess to know Christ, but are in this position of hypocrisy, 
you've professed one thing, but you have behaved in a way that would convince those who are looking at you that you really don't believe what you say you believe. Then the invitation is given that you repent and believe. Because even our Lord extended invitation to the Pharisee and to the scribe and to the hypocrite that they would come and have eternal life. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for if you do not God, and here's the thing about it, we ought to remember this, God's eyes roam to and fro throughout the whole earth, and they see every deed done in darkness. They see all your wicked deeds. And you may think that uh, your wife or your husband or your pastors will not see your hypocrisy. We may never, but God sees it. And it is concerning Him, concerning His oversight of our lives. That, that's what we are, to, to, we are to occupy ourselves with. That God is overseeing our activities. And He knows the hypocrites. But amazingly, He invites them to come and have eternal life. So that's what we've seen here in Philippians chapter 1. The hypocrisy, the truth of it, we're warned against it. We're shown what the opposite of a hypocrite is. And we're shown that it is a great sin which deserves hell, but that Jesus came to save hell-deserving sinners and died and rose again. And all who believed, all who embraced Him, all who turned from hypocrisy. Do you know God saved me from hypocrisy? God saved me. I was a rank hypocrite. And God saved me. God can save the most vile of hypocrites. And I'm exhibit A of that very reality. So come. If you hunger, if you thirst, come unto the Lord Christ. And He promises to give you freely of the bounty of God to make you rich in faith and to give you an everlasting inheritance in heaven. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you would bless these words that have been spoken, that you would bless the preaching of your word as it has gone out, and that Christ is glorified in its effects. May our church be nourished by these precious words. And may we as a congregation, as a group of believers, guard ourselves from hypocrisy. I think about myself and my dear brother, my co-pastor Travis. I pray that you would be doubly diligent to guard ourselves from the, the dangers of hypocrisy. We pray that you would keep us. God, we, we, we look at these things and we have the fear that we're going to fall and we're going to falter. We, we know this, as Paul said... You will bring that work to perfection. And so we rejoice. To Christ be glory for doing such things for us. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.